Okay, so good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you all for joining so promptly. Uh, as a brief introduction, I'm Daniel Mee, Principal Integrity Engineer at Cadent Gas and part of the Pipeline Industries Guild's Midlands uh, Professional Development Network branch. And we'll be hosting today's webinar on the Environment Agency's new National Flood Risk Assessment, NAFRA 2. So personally, I became aware of this piece of work um, as part of an energy sector show and tell last year. And I'm delighted to welcome Celia Jonquit Burns and Jonathan Boyd from the Environment Agency to provide an update on the project. So as per the note in the chat, if you could all remain on mute with your cameras off, that would be appreciated to save on bandwidth. And if you could pop any questions that you have in the chat, we'll collate them at the end and pose them to the Environment Agency team. So without further ado, I'll go on mute, turn my camera off and uh, hand over to Jonathan. Thank you. Uh, uh, afternoon, everybody. Um, yeah, so I, I don't think the presentation needs any uh, any further introduction than uh, than that. So I'll just launch straight into it. Um, so what I'm going to run through today for you all is to just talk a little bit about what NAFRA 2 is, um, touch briefly on how it works because it's quite different to what we've done before, which then queues up the next section in looking in a bit more detail um, as to how NAFRA 2 is different. Um, we'll have a quick look at some of the outputs that it'll produce, because again, that's course, quite different from uh, what we've produced before. I'm going to touch a little bit on um, the, the, the climate change component of NAFRA 2 um, and its impact analysis, because they're two areas where things have moved on uh, significantly for us. So if we just launch straight into looking at what is NAFRA 2, um, it's actually easiest, I think, to, uh, to, to talk about what NAFRA 2 is not. So anybody that's been involved in flood risk assessments for the last sort of 15 years or so um, will be familiar with what we term in the Environment Agency our current NAFRA. Uh, now NAFRA is a uh, is an odd terminology. It's, uh, it stands for the National Flood Risk Assessment, but our current NAFRA is synonymous with our published product risk of flooding from rivers in the sea. So what we call NAFRA in the EA is what the public um, and yourselves, no doubt, will see when you log on to uh, gov.uk um, and you see these um, 50 metre grid cells of high, medium and low risk uh, presented to you. Now, NAFRA 2 um, will be providing the information that we will publish in place of the current risk of flooding from rivers and sea, but it's not replacing the risk of flooding from rivers and sea uh, product. That product will remain, it will just look slightly different um, because it will use outputs from NAFRA 2 rather than our current um, assessment. Now, as well as producing maps, which is what we've sort of done to date, NAFRA 2 is a lot more than just a revamp to our current flood risk assessment. Um, it's a live operational system, um, which essentially means it's, it, it's there, it has a, a user interface, people can log on to it, interact with it. Um, now, that is only for internal staff currently, um, but we can come on to how that might change or move on in the future. Um, it includes multiple sources of flooding. So currently, um, our NAFRA is published as risk of flooding from rivers and sea. So the clues in the name, it only gives you those two sources of flooding. Um, we're widening NAFRA 2 out, includes surface water as standard as well. It produces much richer information, so we're moving away from simply having these um, high, medium, low risk 50 meter grid cells. Um, it will work at all scales, which essentially means we only need one assessment to look at national scale inquiries right down to the uh, to the detailed local picture. I'll expand on all of this in the, on the coming slides um, because of the way it approaches climate change. It's fit for purpose for now and for use in the future. Um, and as I've already mentioned before, um, it's got this um, it's got a user interface that wraps around it, which allows people to get on um, and, uh, and query it, interact with it and manipulate some of the data inside it. Um, and it's I think probably the most in, of interest to you guys today is it includes a much better um, impact analysis uh, compared to what we've done previously. So let's have a look at some of those in a bit more detail. Um, so to start with, why are we even doing uh, NAFRA 2 in the first place? So we originally ran our current uh, NAFRA, which uses a MDSF2 model uh, back in 2002. 
Um, and we've incrementally made improvements to um, to MDSF2 to increase the, the quality of its output. But it's fair to say after, you know, 20 years um, of use, we're kind of running out of steam with what we could uh, change um, our customers internally and externally. Um, expect to see a lot more from a risk assessment in the, in the sort of the, the current era. Um, moving across, we've always had this discontinuity between the national and the local picture. Um, the Environment Agency is quite rich in terms of um, modelled uh, risk assessment, providing evidence on flood risk. Um, that's not what we publish um, on the uh, on the internet, so it can be quite a confusing picture when we're sharing. Uh, one picture with our customers and partners and we've got um, a, a wealth of information that we can refer to internally so that's always been slightly confusing. Uh, next up it runs at a very core scale I've mentioned a couple of times already these 50 meter grid cells um, you know increasing resolution doesn't equate to increasing accuracy um, but it's fair to say 50 meter grid resolution is uh, is pretty coarse by today's standards we all know of um, the, the, the classic problem where you've got, you know, tightly packed receptors like terraced houses um, in a, a, on a linear street going uphill away from the, uh, the river. They're all banded up, you know, it's black and white. You're either, you're either at that level of risk or you're not. And uh, we all know it's a, it's a lot more nuanced than that. Uh, next problem is we've got um, different products for different flood sources and they're all produced by slightly different methods. So the closest thing we have to the outputs of NAFRA 2 at the moment is our risk of flooding from rivers and sea products. Um, they do look very, very different, not least because the surface water is produced at a uh, two metre grid resolution. Um, and it also contains um, the richer information that we've already talked about, such as depths and velocities, which we, uh, we don't have in our risk of flooding from rivers and sea products. Quite staggeringly, um, given just how on the mind of the collective sort of global conscious it is at the moment, there is no published climate change um, information whatsoever contained in our risk for different residency products at the moment. So NAFRA at the moment just does not do climate change at all, uh, which I find quite uh, quite hard to believe, really. Um, and NAFRA was designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that was to say what is the residual risk of flooding um, in England and what are the associated damages with, with that risk? And, and that, that was it, it's a bit of a one trick pony. There's not much we can do with it in terms of analysing it, interpreting it or uh, delving in uh, deeper. Um, it, it, it did the one thing and the one thing well. Um, with NAFRA 2, we want to be able to query it and um, do a little bit of what if planning with it as well. So moving away from the national picture for a second, I've already mentioned the Environment Agency's got um, a huge back catalogue um, of local detailed flood modelling that is built up in the same period of time that we've had NAFRA. Um, this is what contains all our sort of rich information. Um, they cover far more scenarios than uh, NAFRA 2 does, uh, sorry, not NAFRA 2, than NAFRA does. Uh, it contains all our depth information, our velocities, um, it's got, you know, we'll have modelled climate change, we do defended, undefended, breach runs, you know, you name it, they're, they're in there somewhere. Now, this isn't helpful having um, all this information that we can't easily draw on, and it's not helpful when we publish one sort of broad national picture for everybody to look at and to share and to use. Um, yeah, if people ring us up to discuss it or talk about it, um, you know, we've got much different information that we can uh, that we can refer to uh, internally. So we want to start to bring those two sides of the coin together. Um, so what that all means essentially is over the years we've built up uh, into a position where we've had different products which we use for different purposes. So we've got the risk of flooding from rivers and sea um, from NAFRA. Uh, we've got the risk of from surface water done with a different methodology shown at a different scale. We've got our local detailed flood models, which we only really use internally. And then right over on the left, uh, right hand side, we've got the flood map planning, which uh, you know drives a lot of spatial planning decisions. Um, uh, but essentially, the point I'm trying to get across here is we've we've got very different different products, different purposes, lots of different uses, um, and the whole picture isn't quite as uh, neatly put together as it could be. So I'll have a look at NAFRA 2 now um, and go through how that's going to work. 
and it's a hugely complicated system which would take um many many days and many weeks to actually explain properly what's going on inside it but if we distill it down to this conceptual diagram um one of the big things that nafra 2 does is as well as the local detail modeling that we have internally we've also commissioned a large um a large model that covers all of England, which we're calling the new national modeling. Um, and this is essentially, it's a, it's a JFlow model. It runs at a two meter resolution. Um, it contains our asset information. And what that does is we set out with the intention to build NAFRA 2 the other way around. So rather than having a broad scale national product, which we then patch in local data where we have it, um, what we wanted to do with NAFRA 2 was use the local modelling and where we've got the local modelling that comes through into the answers uh, that, that NAFRA 2 outputs. So you're using the best available information to base that assessment on. But obviously we haven't got um, local detailed modelling on sort of every inch of the country. So we had to do something um, to, to augment the information that we already have. So moving on. We're also bringing our stock of uh, local detail models in. So the combination of the new national modelling and the local model outputs means that um, for, the, for the whole of England, we have hazard outputs produced um, by one by one mean or another. The next input data along is the receptor data. And all we've done in the previous NAFRA um, was use residential and non-residential um, point receptors so we could tell you whether a residential or a non-residential property was at high medium or low risk of flooding and that was it uh, as well as the damages that came from that with nafra 2 we're expanding that receptor data um, to include um, it's essentially just the the nrd data set so the the granularity of what's contained inside the uh, the receptor data the receptor data set is what NAFRA 2 will report its metrics against. Um, and for the first time, we're also including linear features such as um, such as roads, uh, railway, and we've got um, the uh, we've got things like electro electricity substations, uh, water treatment plants, that kind of stuff in there. So we're looking at, at uh, a lot more infrastructure, not just um, residential, non-residential properties. And then finally, we've got the asset data. So if we bring the new national modelling, the local modelling together, that gives us a hazard outputs. If we add the receptor data in, we can then turn those hazards into impacts. Um, but what we really need to understand is what is actually at risk. And we can't put that um, picture together um, of, of the uh, of understanding what the true residual risk is without having some kind of representation of our assets in there as well. And then moving up to the top of the diagram, um, all of this in the green and the blue boxes is going on automatically within NAFRA 2. So we need some way to interact and make sense of that. So we have the user interface up at the top. This allows a, a user to find outputs or define a query. So there's certain um, scenarios, return periods, etc., that NAFRA 2 will output as standard. We call these the standard outputs. Um, but we've got a what if um, functionality in, uh, in in NAFRA 2 as well. So if there's a certain scenario that doesn't exist that a user is interested in, there is some way that the processing inside NAFRA 2 uh, can delve into its own library of information and return that query for a user. And we'll touch on that a little bit later. And all of that can be done um, within the NAFRA 2 system itself. Now, again, I mentioned that this is an internal system. So it's only going to be EA staff that have that function to log on to it, to manipulate, to analyze and to query. Um, but what it will do is pass data out into this purple box over here um, and it will be providing the information that supports our current published data products. So risk of flooding from rivers and sea, risk of flooding from surface water, flood map for planning, etc. They're not going anywhere. Uh, NAFRA 2 isn't replacing those products. They'll still be there on gov.uk. Um, but they will just look slightly different. They'll look the same uh, as what you're used to, but just with much better, uh, better quality information supporting them. Um, so there's just a couple of examples to just show um, this concept of bringing local modelling um, 
local modelling in from, from different areas. So on this slide here, we've got um, an area which is covered by um, two local models and the NNM, which gives you a coverage of three models in total. Uh, I'm not going to go into detail of what the processing is, but essentially inside NAFRA 2, there's a, a set of logical rules and processing steps that combines and merges those outputs together. Um, and what that means is that everywhere, regardless of where your information comes from, you get a consistent output nationally, which will look something like we have over on the right hand side here. A quick example of the richer information that it produces. So over on the left hand side, we've got the current flood zones, which are essentially two different colours of uh, incredibly large broad brush outlines, which uh, just your, your 100 year, 1000 year return periods. And underneath that, we've got the current risk of flooding from rivers and sea, or what we call NAFRA. Um, that's your 50 metre grid cell. If we look at that large box in the centre, NAFRA 2 will start producing outputs at much higher resolution. It'll contain lots of different return periods. It'll move on to depth, velocities, hazard information, all that kind of stuff as well. So we're getting a much clearer picture of what's at risk. Um, now, a lot of this stuff will be coming from local modelling, but even where we are um, relying on the new national model, I don't want to give the impression that because this is a national scale model, that it's some sort of high level broad brush approach that is, you know, good enough, but not really kind of thing. Um, it's a really good quality model in its own right. So if we look down at the bottom here, um, the bottom left, we've got the 50 meter grid cells, which are clipped to the uh, to the floodplain. And you might be able to see the floodplain bears absolutely no resemblance to where the river channel is uh, whatsoever. Um, with the new national model over on the uh, bottom right there, you can see very clearly how the uh, the river channel itself and that gradation in depth is, uh, is really picked up. So the new national model, um, don't confuse it with being a, a very broad brush, um, you know, not fit for purpose model. It's, uh, it's, it's very much not that. So there's a couple of ways that NAFRA 2 is uh, is very different from what we've done before. Um, and the big concept that drives NAFRA 2 and makes it fit for use now and in the future is concept which we're calling indexing. Um, now, I wouldn't dwell too much on what's on screen. Uh, I wouldn't bother reading the, the definition of indexing. But maybe just look at that bottom line. What we're doing in NAFRA 2 is cataloguing local and national model data uh, based on its loading conditions and asset states. So to unpack that a little bit, traditionally what we do when we model things is we set out to produce a deterministic uh, modelled output. So if something happens, what does that look like? Um, and then we label that. So for example, here we would get a, a model, we would run a one in five, um, one in 10, one in 100 year outline, we would fix those in, in sort of time, call them the one in five, the one in 10, the one in 100, and each of those outlines would have a map associated with it. What we're doing in NAFRA 2 is we're taking all of our modelled outputs, whether they're from local models or from national models, and regardless of what they were shown to be modelling in the first place, because we've built this um, catalogue of models up, over sort of you know 15, 18 years or so, regardless of what we were calling them back then, because things aren't stationary uh, due to climate change, things change, things move on. What we're really doing um, is we're modeling for a fluvial model anyway, we're modeling flow at, at a given location in the river channel. So instead of calling them one in five, one in 10, one in 100 year outlines, we can just say, this is, this is a map which shows what's at risk if we get 20, 30 or, or 40 um, QMAX of uh, flow at a given location. NAFRA 2 then takes over <coughs> the, the, the processing. So if somebody is using NAFRA 2 and they are interested in the present day to see what we would uh, term a one in 10 year outline in today's money, NAFRA 2 would work out whether or not things have moved on or changed um, since then. It would work out that what you're really wanting to, to, um, to see the results of when you're asking for this one in 10 in, in uh, today is you're looking at something that's modeled the outputs of a peak flow of 30 QMEX. It would then delve into its simulation library and find all the various models that, uh, that match that flow. So what that means is we're building up a picture 
Um, and again, this is just the fluvial example, but this is exactly the same whether we're talking overtopping rates on the coast or rainfall intensity for surface water. We're building up a network of um, gauge locations around the country and we're doing this everywhere. So we take this example when the slides move on. There we go. Um, so we take this example and all over the country, we've got these 1K grid, square, uh, 1K grid squares and the green dots in the centre uh, represent every location where we've got uh, rainfall intensity modelled um, and the blue dots, which are not centrally located, are essentially the, um, the places where we've got um, flows on uh, linear river channels. So putting all that together, what that means is in the background of NAFRA 2, um, for a given location, and in this example here, we, we may have four um, models that have been done um, at various stages in time for different purposes. But what they're essentially doing is they're all showing um, they're all showing scenarios which represent a given amount of flow at the same location. And then we build that up into a picture by combining all of the modeled outputs together into what we call this virtual gauge board um, over on the right here. So, for example, uh, the River Irwell model up at the top there, 2007, it looks like it's only produced two, two modelled outlines. They're the blue dots up at the top. I would imagine they were probably the 100 and 1,000 year outline, which we would have done for sort of flood map planning purposes. But we've got other models which have um, modelled different flow rates in the same location, and NAFRA 2 can make use of all of these things as, as proxies for others. So, how is that helpful? Let's look at that in a, the context of climate change. So let's assume um, that we're we're back in 2008 and we've done sort of a and other um, flood risk assessment and we've modelled the return periods that you see um, across the top. So we've got 2, 5, 10, 20, 25, 30, 50, 75, 100 year 100 year plus climate change, 200 and 1,000 year. That was a fairly standard set of deliverables that we would uh, we would set out to model. Um, now we've got climate change run, but because it was 2008, all we did back in 2008 when people wanted to understand what things might look like um, if climate change allowances were applied, was we just increased the flows by 20% back then. It's very, very broad scale guidance. Um, so what we've done there is we've taken the nomin nominal 150 um, QMEX associated with a 100 year outline and we've said, OK, if we have a 100 year flood uh, with climate change added on, then we have 20 percent, we get 180. Um, however, it's now 2023 and we've got a new set of climate change guidance. Uh, and between 2008 and 2023, we've had numerous iterations of our climate change guidance. They, they, they change all the time. Uh, we've got different scenarios, different epochs, all kinds of stuff that we need to think about. So what we've done in the past in the traditional way of doing modelling is we've always gone back to the drawing board and said, right, OK, well, things have changed. Things have moved on. We don't understand what happens here anymore. And um, we're going to need to remodel. Well, well, do we? Because if under say a, um, a higher central um, long dated um, future epoch we go back to the modeling and we and we think to ourselves well rather than adding 20 percent on and getting to 180 um, a hundred year climate change outline might be more in the region of say 210 220 qmex well we've already got the impact of what that modeling would look like um, from this model it's just that back then we would have called it the 200 year outline instead. So if we had um, an even more um, pessimistic view of climate change, either at a different epoch or in a future release of climate change guidance, um, what if the climate change outline was seen to equate to something around the 500 QMEX? Again, we've already got that modelled here um, in, the, in the thousand year. So it won't always directly uh, relate like that, but if you go back to this slide and imagine we've got this spread of flows all around the country all over for loads of different flows all all, all around the place um, there will be something there that could be used as a, as a surrogate or a proxy um, and NAFRA 2 also can carry out some um, some basic non-linear 
um, spatial interpolation as well. So if you're quite close between two return periods, then uh, you can also get NAFRA2 to give you a, a lower confidence um, answer by using interpolated data as well. Um, and then the other thing where we've, we've, um, we've moved NAFRA2 on significantly from NAFRA um, is in its impact analysis. Now, I couldn't find any uh, examples of the, the impacts that we used to calculate using NAFRA because it's, it's got that old now. I don't seem to be able to track it down. But essentially what we did was we had um, residential and non-residential properties um, we were able to tell which of those fell into the high, medium and low risk um, 50 metre grid squares. And we broke that down by sort of either local authority areas or political constituency boundaries. But essentially all we could tell you was what properties were at high, medium or low risk of flooding. So we move on now to what we're doing in NAFRA 2. Uh, we still got residential and non-residential properties but we're, um, we're breaking these down into, into subcategories. So your residential stuff now covers um, people and risk to life, as well as things like vehicles. Non-residential, we're breaking that down into sort of education, commercial properties, tourism, recreation, agriculture, that kind of stuff. Um, as well as that, we've got the infrastructure, utilities and transport. But what's also interesting is if you look down the left-hand side of this diagram, in the property and related impacts. That is the kind of point in polygon, i.e. we have a grid square of high risk. Let's see what exists inside that um, inside that square, this point in polygon. Um, that's how we always counted receptors in NAFRA. And that only forms uh, one aspect of the, the impact assessment in NAFRA 2. So as well as just looking at what's directly contained in the flood outline, um, we go on to look at um, at, at, uh, at secondary impacts um, and disruption. So not just understanding uh, whether an electricity substation is flooded, but understanding what the knock on impact of that is in terms of loss of power and that kind of stuff. Not just understanding whether a, um, a, a kilometre of rail or two kilometres of road is flooded, but what's the impact in terms of disruption, passenger numbers, that kind of stuff. So we're doing an awful lot more. Um, with our impact analysis. Um, in terms of its outputs, the property outputs top left, that's what we've always done. Um, and that's what we're continuing to do. This idea of having a flood outline with a receptor inside it. Um, but NAFRA 2 will also be um, producing sort of uh, a large spatial array of what the risk to life is um, across the country. It's looking at the um, secondary impacts of, uh, of the energy network, which were on top right. Uh, road and rail, which I've already covered, um, large spatial areas like agriculture. So we often get asked um, about what, uh, about how much agricultural land is flooded. Um, so we're bringing that into NAFRA too. Um, and then large sites is uh, is another one. So looking at parcels of land which may contain, um, if you imagine sort of something large, uh, like a power station, you know, there may be the, the main receptor point, but there'll be um, all sorts of sort of auxiliary and ancillary buildings and, uh, and things associated with that as well. Uh, and then finally, I've talked a lot about what NAFRA does, but actually what will NAFRA 2 look like? Um, I'm not going to go through this whole slide, but essentially in terms of the outputs that we're going to use NAFRA 2 for, i.e. our published products, they're not going to change. I mentioned that one before. So what you're familiar with now is still going to be there. Um, it's just that you'll see it with um, more information contained. We'll be bringing in climate change outlines as well as just showing um, what we do currently. Um, and we've got it all at a, a much finer resolution um, with depths, velocities, all that kind of stuff as well. So fundamentally, the products are the same. They're just being improved. Um, in terms of NAFRA 2 itself, and I will just uh, reiterate that what we're seeing now is what is going to be available internally to begin with. Um, this is the sort of thing that a, a, a user logging onto NAFRA 2 would see. So they would be asked to go on um, and define what it is that they're, they're wanting to see, whether they're looking at a, a single event for a, a fluvial event or a coastal event, or whether they want to see what the residual risk looks like. You'd start on this screen. It would then walk you through building that query. And I just want to pause on this screen for a second because here we've got 
um, how we're bringing in the, the climate change example. So again, we don't just have here is NEFRA um, and here is NEFRA with climate change. Um, a user can go on and say, well, okay, I mean, I'm interested in the higher central or lower estimate, um, and I'm interested in the 2050s epoch or the 2080s epoch. Um, so we can build these queries up as we as we move through it. Um, and when we've done all that, what we end up with is something like we've got on screen at the moment. Um, so very high resolution, um, higher accuracy if it's coming from the local modelling. Um, view of what's at risk and uh, and what that contains. This is obviously just one output, you know, this is showing depths. We could produce the same thing again for hazards. We could put different receptors on it. Um, and a lot of you might be thinking, well, so what? Because it kind of looks the same as, as what we had on the uh, on the first slide. Um, and it kind of does, you know, it's, it's essentially the same map, um, but just with smaller squares. But if you take a minute to recap what we've been through, um, what we had on the left hand side is we were able to show you what was at high risk of flooding, medium risk of flooding, and low risk of flooding from rivers in the sea. And that was it. And we gave you that at a 50 metre resolution. Whereas now what we're doing is we can bring all that likelihood of flooding across into NAFRA 2. Um, but we can also bring in depths. We can add in velocities. Um, because we've got depths and velocities, we could ask for a probability of inundation. So rather than just saying something's at high risk of flooding, we could say um, what's the average um, what's the average annual chance of a property being flooded to above 200 mil, 150 mil, 500 mil. Um, it's all user configurable. We're not giving you it at a 50 meter resolution. This is going to be available everywhere at a two meter resolution. It's got rivers like the previous one had, sea as well. We've also got surface water, um, we're including climate change, we've got property impacts, site impacts, economic damages, it's adaptable, it's future proof because of the way it indexes uh, and can do climate change. Um, and I could keep on going, um, but if I did everything or tried to display everything that NAFRA 2 could do, we'd just end up peppering this whole slide with little green boxes and there'd be nothing to see anymore. So apologies if that was a really quick um, breathless rocket through what NAFRA 2 does, but it really does do um, an awful lot of stuff. Um, and it's very hard to condense down everything that it's doing in a short presentation. So I shall stop and pause for breath um, and give people a chance to, uh, to ask any questions. Brilliant, cheers, cheers Jonathan. Um, not quite so any questions in the chat at the minute, but um... I've got a couple, um, if that's all right. So in terms of the the greater granularity that's being provided from the, the model and redu reducing it from that 50 metre grids, what, what data sources are you using to, to get that greater granularity? Is it LIDAR? Is it something else? Um, so the, the, the granularity comes from the fact that we're using um, just just better, higher resolution models. So, for example, the, the new national model itself is a JFlow model um, that is it, it produces its native outputs at the two meter resolution where we've got local modeling. If that local modeling is done at a higher resolution um, than, than two meters, then that higher resolution will come through. Um, and it will depend in terms of the, the elevation grid that you mentioned. Um, so we're using the, now I've got to get the terminology right, it's the Environment Agency's Integrated Height Map, I think we call it. And that is essentially, um, it, it, it will, I think some of it still might be the, the old SAR data, although I'm not sure now, but essentially wherever we've got um, our elevation data, it's a composite map, so if some of it's five, two, whatever, um, then it, 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 it all comes through. But it's um, NAFRA 2 isn't really using anything in terms of the elevation model itself. What NAFRA 2 uses is the outputs from the uh, from the modelling. So it will be whatever the um, whatever the, the model used in terms of its elevation data will pass through to NAFRA 2 because NAFRA 2 is using its outputs. It's not carrying out its own modelling itself that comes from the NNM, which is two meter. Okay, great. Um, so one from Chris Packwood. Um, so how, how does NAFRA 2 deliver different climate change scenario outcomes? And can you talk more about how 
NAFRA to account for the different scenarios? Um, do you want do you want to expand your question, Chris? Because uh, obviously the the, um, the 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 way it, the way it does it is with the uh, is with the indexing that I that I ran through in the presentation. So I think what what it's probably looking at there is around like so for the UK climate change scenarios. There are there are a range of RCPs depending on how close we get to the climate change targets and net zero. So you've got 8.5, 4.5 and, and things like that. So is that considered in that sort of terminology or is it done slightly differently through this? It, it's it's not done slightly differently. And I'm I'm not an expert on our um, on our own climate change policy. Um, one of the model runs that we've done in the new national modelling is a model run of RCP 8.5. I know that for a fact. Um, but I think essentially, as the as as the climate change guidance um, is either released or changes changes or is updated, what what that all what what that all comes back to is you've got the policy which tells you what that's going to do to your flows what that's going to do to your sea level what that's going to do to rainfall intensity so we're moving away from the from the labeling um so if what you're interested in boils down to a location going from 10 cumex to 50 cumex then nafra 2 can return that if what you're interested in on the coast is uh, a prediction that by 2050 sea, uh, sea still water levels on the coast will have increased in that particular geographic area by um, half a metre, then NAFRA 2 can return that. So the labelling and where the climate change guidance gets you doesn't matter. Um, and NAFRA 2 has um, sort of operational rules within it that we can change at the drop of a hat. So at the moment, NAFRA 2 will prevent, present you with, if I get back to it, it will present you with the options to look at the, um, the climate change scenarios and the climate change epochs that are in our current guidance. Let's say in three years time, we've updated that and we've got UKCP insert date um, and that's changed and we call these something different. This is an element of NAFRA 2, which is very, very easy to, to alter. So if we're all working from a, a completely different song sheet in the future with regard to climate change, we can update NAFRA 2 by just updating its, um, its, its operating rules within, within it. So it'd have a different lookup table. It would be looking for different things that give them a different label. But fundamentally, wh when you ask it the question, it comes back to its simulation library and its indexing methods to, to, to actually find that result for you. So do, does, that, does, that, does that answer the question, Chris? Hi, Jonathan. Yeah, sorry, I was I was speaking on mute earlier, but that's 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 spot on. Thank you very much. No worries. Great. Um, another one from me then, selfishly. Um, so on you, on one of the maps, you showed the the different receptors that are available. So as um, as sort of members of the guild and asset owners and various people along the supply chain, how how does how do we import and support NAFRA 2 in terms of getting those receptors right with the right assumptions and uh, any how do we potentially model any inter interdependencies? Yeah so so this is a, a question that comes up um, sort of time and time again after I run through this presentation and, and, and rightly so. Um, so we at, at the moment that it's only a fair I think it's, it's safe to say it's only a fairly basic assessment of some of the um, secondary impacts and some of the knock-on impacts we can only model um, what we know. We can only find out what receptor's at risk if we know where that receptor is. Um, the more information, the more data we have on where receptors are, um, we can obviously increase the quality of our impact assessment. One of the problems that we're gonna run into is who's actually best placed to, to do that assessment. So when we spec NAFRA 2 up, we included the receptors that are shown on this slide because based on the, the, the feedback that we got when we did, if anybody have ever heard of ABC1, we went out and consulted with the um, flood risk management community internally and externally. And these were the sort of things that were coming back. People were saying, oh, I want, I want to be able to see road, I want to see rail, you know, I want this included in, in a, a, 
a, a newer version of NAFRA. So we forged ahead and we've put those in and we've done our own impact analysis on them. Um, we got into a conversation with Network Rail a couple of weeks ago about whether or not really the Environment Agency or Network Rail want the Environment Agency speaking on Network Rail's behalf about what part of their infrastructure is at risk and what that knock on impact means. So we've done the best we can with our impact assessment based on data that we've got from um, I mean, I know we've got some uh, some energy network stuff in there. Network Rail have given us things as well. Um, but when it comes to things like what redundancies there in the in the network are, the workarounds, you know, can does a substation going down that serves this number of properties actually mean there's disruption to that number of properties? We don't know because obviously, you know. Yeah, the, the network can be moved around. So that I think there's a fundamental question, which is, um, should we be taking more and more data and doing a better impact assessment, which then obviously means we need to keep getting updated copies of that data? Should we be the people that are actually the ones reporting on it, speaking with the people's behalves, or as the experts in what's at risk from flooding, should we stop? at producing really high quality flood risk outputs and pass that data on and let other people take our data and do their own impact assessment. And then, you know, we've got what we need for our purposes um, and other people can get hold of what they need for, for their own purposes. So it, it's part of an ongoing conversation, but it does it does draw it into focus when you when you look at the impact assessment in, uh, in NAFRA 2. So, yeah, you, you're entirely right to ask that question. Yeah. And I think just observationally from from a, a gas perspective, um, operating the assets that we do, um, we operate a sealed system. And, and just because of the, the site or the asset may be at risk of flooding doesn't necessarily mean it's going to fail as a result of the flooding. So that's that's one of the key things that as part of the work we're doing. And, um, and I know the other gas distribution networks are doing it is taking that intelligence from the environment agency models and then. Doing our, like you say, doing our own impact and risk assessment to then determine where we need to improve resilience, um, be it at site level or network level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I think where NAFRA 2 can help you is if you know your receptors are safe up to a certain um, depth or whether they're set. I know a lot of your stuff's underground, so it's a bit different to what we've done, mm. uh, you know, with, with with previous presentations. But if you've got, say, you know, some some site which, you know, is safe up to a, a given depth or to a given velocity, that's the kind of information that you can get out of NAFRA too. So rather than just saying, oh, this is at high, medium or low risk, we can say, well, OK, let's, let's look into the future um, on a medium emission scenario for the 2050s what show me the areas of, of england that would um be inundated to more than 300 mils if you knew 300 mils a cut off for you at a given site um it would return those parcels of land which is what it's doing um if we go back which is what it's doing with with these kind of outputs so based on the query that you put in you could say well look you know i don't need to worry about my sites um uh, until we get more than um you know a given velocity or a given depth or something like that um and and it would show you it would it would highlight what where those areas are so it would enable you to to carry out that kind of assessment where you knew you had um a given threshold rather than just something getting wet being a problem the the thing to mention with all of this though is at the moment if you're familiar with our risk of flooding from surface water product, um, you'll know that we project, we publish the um, check your long term flood risk on gov.uk, but that only returns whether you're at high, medium or low risk of flooding. If you go onto data.gov.uk, you can then get much more information out of that risk of surface water product. So you can request the depths and the velocities and that, all that richer information. Um, we're looking at the moment as, as to how much of NAFRA 2's output we can we can do that with. So the intention for NAFRA 2 and its outputs is exactly the same in that we will keep publishing those four main products on gov.uk. But the intention is to make all of the rich information available to partners via data.gov.uk. So if you want to see the depths, if you want to see the velocities for whichever source of flooding, uh, you know, for whatever kind of output, you'll be able to do that. Now, at the moment, 
we don't know categorically what is going to be available on gov.uk because there's a phenomenal amount of data being produced um, and we're in the process of looking at what our actual system architecture and stuff can handle in terms of uh, passing that information you know how much of that data can we publish externally how much can we make available how often can we update it because NAFRA 2 is a live system so if the modeling changes or the evidence changes so too do the outputs um, you know it's one thing to get you know terabytes of data and put it on uh, data.gov.uk for people to download it's another thing to have to do that every month you know that's different to doing it once a year so the intention is the same we just can't categorically say how close to the um uh you know how fully we'll realize that intention just yet so just a, a caveat there mm. no that's that's great um so i think that that's it for that's it for me in terms of questions um i can't see any more in the chat um so all that's left for me to do unless Kate, unless there's anything that I've missed, um, is to thank Jonathan and Celia for, for joining the call and for, for presenting the update today. Um, I found it really useful and really insightful. I hope others did too. And um, the recording will be posted um, on the Pipeline Industries Guild's social media channels and YouTube um, for anyone that wishes to view it or share it offline. Thank you all. Thank you for hey. having us. Am, am I right in thinking we, uh, me and Celia, are disappearing now? Is that the is that the plan? Yeah, all sorts of. Yeah, yeah, lovely. Okay, thanks everybody. Thanks all. Thank you, Dan, for organising. Bye. No problem.